Essays on Art by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, translated by Samuel Gray Ward, Ancient and Modern. Having been obliged, in what goes before, to say so much in favor of antiquity, and particularly of the plastic arts of those times, it was my wish that I might not be misunderstood, which so often happens where the reader, instead of preserving a just balance, throws himself at once into the opposite scale. I therefore seized the present opportunity to explain what my meaning was having reference under the symbol of plastic art to the never-ceasing life of human actions and affairs. A young friend, Karl Ernst Schubart, in his pamphlet A Critique on Goethe, which in every sense calls for my esteem and thanks, says, I do not agree in opinion with those worshippers of the ancients, among whom is Goethe himself, who maintains that in high and complete development of humanity nothing has ever been arrived at to compare with the Greeks. Fortunately, Schubert's own words give us an opportunity to adjust this difference, where he says, as to our Goethe, let me say that i prefer shakespeare to him for this reason that in shakespeare i seem to find a strong unconscious man who is able with perfect certainty and without reasoning reflecting subtilizing and classifying to seize with never failing hand the true and false in man and express it with so much nature whilst in goethe though i recognize the same ultimate aim i am always fighting with obstacles and must be always taking heed lest i accept for plain truth what is only an exhibition of as plain error here our friend hits the nail on the head for in that very point where he places me below shakespeare do we stand below the ancients and what is it we advance concerning the ancients any talent the development of which is not favored by time and circumstances and must on that account work its way through a thousand obstacles and get rid of a thousand errors must always be at a disadvantage when compared with a contemporary one that has the opportunity to cultivate itself with facility and act to the extent of its capacity without opposition it often happens that persons advanced in life are able out of the fullness of their experience to advance something that will explain or strengthen an assertion which shall be my excuse for relating the following anecdote a practised diplomatist who had desired my acquaintance after the first interview when he had had but little opportunity of seeing or conversing with me remarked to his friends voila un homme qui a en de grands chagrins these words set me to thinking the skilful physiognomous eye did not deceive him only he laid to the effect of suffering the phenomenon that should have been ascribed to opposition an observant straightforward german might have said this is a man who has had a hard time of it is soured since then the signs of past experience and of persevering activity do not disappear from the face it is no wonder if all that remains of us and our strivings should bear the same impress and indicate to the attentive observer a mode of being whose aim has been to preserve its balance alike under circumstances of happiest development or narrowest limitation and maintain the persistency if it could not always the highest dignity of human existence but letting pass old and new past and present let us generally lay it down that every artistic production places us in the same state of mind the author was in if that was clear and bright we shall feel free if that was narrow timid and anxious we shall feel limited in the same proportion upon reflection we would add that we speak now only of treatment material and import do not enter into the consideration if having reference to this principle we look around in the world of art 
we uphold that every work will afford us pleasure which the artist himself produced with ease and facility what amateur does not rejoice in the possession of a successful drawing or etching of our chowdawiki we see in them such an immediate apprehension of nature as we know it that they leave nothing to wish for but he would not be able to go beyond his mark and line without losing all the advantage he derives from his peculiar qualifications we will even go farther and confess that we have derived great pleasure from mannerists when the manner has not been carried too far and that we are pleased with the possession of their works the artists who have received this name have been gifted with uncommon talent but became early aware that in the state of the times as well as of the schools into which they were cast by fate there was no room for minute labor but that they must choose their part and perfect themselves speedily they therefore made themselves a language into which they could without farther trouble translate with ease and dexterity all visible subjects and exhibit to us representations of all sorts of scenes with greater or less success thus whole nations have been entertained and hoodwinked for long periods of time until at last one or another artist has found the way back to nature and a higher feeling of art we may perceive by the herculanean antiquities how the ancients also fell into this kind of manner only their models were too great too present fresh and well preserved for their circle of artists to be able to lose themselves entirely in insignificance let us now assume a higher and more agreeable point of view and consider the talent with which raphael was so singularly gifted born with the happiest natural gifts at a time when art combined the most conscientious labor attention industry and truth the young man was already led by excellent masters to the threshold and had only to raise his foot to enter the temple disciplined by peter perugino in the most careful elaboration his genius was developed by leonardo da vinci and michael angelo neither of these artists in spite of their long life and the cultivation of their powers seem ever to have reached the true enjoyment of artistic production the former if we look closely wearied himself with thought and dissipated his powers in mechanical inquiries and we have to blame the latter for spending his fairest years among stone quarries getting out marble blocks and slabs so that instead of carrying out his intention of carving all the heroes of the old and new testament he has left only his moses as an example of what he could and should have done raphael on the other hand was at work during his whole life increasing all the time in facility we see in him the development of the intellectual and active powers preserve such remarkable balance that it may be affirmed that no modern artist has possessed such purity and completeness of thought and such clearness of expression in him we have another instance of a talent that pours out to us the freshest water from the purest source he is never affected but always feels thinks and works like a greek we see the fairest talent developed in the most favorable hours the same thing occurred under like conditions and circumstances in the time of pericles it may therefore be always maintained that native talent is indispensable to production indeed but equally indispensable is the commensurate development in the provinces of nature and art art cannot dispense with its prerogatives and cannot achieve perfection without favorable outward circumstances consider the school of karachi here was a groundwork of talent earnestness industry and consecutive advantages here was an element for the natural and artistic development of admirable powers we see a whole dozen of excellent artists produced by it 
each practicing and cultivating his peculiar talent according to the same general idea so that it hardly seems possible after times should produce anything similar let us consider moreover the immense stride made by the highly gifted rubens into the world of art he too was no son of earth look at the rich inheritance he was heir to from the old masters of the fourteenth and fifteenth century through all the admirable artists of the sixteenth at the close of which he was born again think of the crowd of dutch painters of the seventeenth century whose great abilities found development now at home now south now north until we can no longer deny the incredible sagacity with which their eye pierced into nature and the facility with which they have succeeded in expressing her legitimate charm so as to enchant us everywhere nay in proportion as we possess the same qualities we are willing for a time to limit ourselves exclusively to the examination and attraction of these productions and are far from blaming those amateurs who are contented with the possession and enjoyment of this class of pictures exclusively in the same way we could bring an hundred examples in support of our assertion to see distinctly to apprehend clearly to impart with facility these are the qualities that enchant us and when we maintain that all these are to be found in the genuine greek works united with the noblest subjects the most exalted import the most unerring and perfect execution it will be seen why it is we always begin and end with them let each one in his own way be a greek but let him be a true greek the same is true of literary merit the comprehensible is always the first to seize upon us and give us complete satisfaction if we take the works of one and the same poet we shall find some that seem to indicate a degree of laborious effort and others again affect us like natural products because the talent was commensurate with the form and import and once more it is our firm belief that although any age may give birth to the fairest talent it is not given to all to be able to develop it in its perfect proportions to conclude we bring forward the instance of a modern artist to show that we do not make too high demands but are satisfied with works and subjects of a limited nature sebastian bourdon an artist of the sixteenth century whose name every amateur is familiar with but whose talent in its genuine direction has never received due praise has left four plates etched by his own hand making a complete series of the flight into egypt in relation to the subject we have to bear in mind that the child is one of singular importance of the most ancient princely descent whose destiny it is to have an immense influence upon the world in after times through whom the old is to be destroyed and the new built up in the place of it this child is born in the arms of a most tender mother under the protection of a prudent old man and escapes and is saved by divine assistance the various scenes in this significant action have been represented a hundred times and have given birth to works of art that have called for our highest admiration we give the subjoined description in order that the amateur who has not these etchings at hand might be able in some measure to decide as to the justice of our commendation joseph appears always as the principal personage perhaps the pictures were intended to adorn a chapel of that saint one the scene appears to be the stall at bethlehem immediately after the departure of the three pious magi for beneath you still see the two well-known beasts in a room above you see joseph at rest making his bed of the pack decorously enveloped in folds of drapery and leaning against the high saddle upon which the holy child is seen moving as if just awake the mother close beside him is deeply engaged in prayer 
in contrast with this quiet daybreak scene appears an angel flying towards joseph pointing with animated action to the country where the sight of temples and obelisks suggest a dream of egypt carpenter's tools lie neglected on the ground two the family is halting amid ruins after a heavy day's journey joseph appears to get a little rest standing as he leans against the sturdy heavy laden beast feeding from a stone trough but an angel comes behind him plucks his mantle and points to the sea beyond joseph looking upward and pointing at the same time to the beast's fodder seems to ask for a short space for the animal to bait the holy mother busied about the child looks round astonished at the strange dialogue for the heavenly messenger seems to be invisible to her three this picture expresses admirably the hasty pilgrimage they are leaving behind them on the right a large town situated on a hill keeping close to the bridle joseph leads the beast down a path which appears the steeper because the eye does not trace it farther and the sea appears directly behind the foreground the mother sitting on the saddle takes no heed of danger her looks are absorbed by the sleeping child the speed of the fugitives is happily indicated by their having already passed through the greater part of the picture and being just on the point of disappearing on the left side four here in entire contrast to the above we see joseph and mary reposing by the stones of a well in the middle of the picture joseph standing behind and leaning over points to a prostrate idol in the foreground and seems to be explaining this significant sign to the holy mother she is earnest and attentive holding the child at her breast but you do not see what she is looking at the disburthened beast browses in the background on the rich green boughs in the distance we recognize the obelisks that were referred to in the dream the palm trees show that we have arrived in egypt all this the artist shows us in so narrow space with light but happy strokes full and penetrating thought spirited life apprehension of the indispensable omission of the unimportant a light and rapid touch in the execution such are the qualities we admire in these plates and of more than these there is no need for here as well as anywhere do we find the end of art attained parnassus is a montserrat allowing of many settlements on its various stages let each one go and look about him and he will find some place be it summit or nook this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.